Fox News starts right now. Bear County leaders have officially entered an agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to provide temporary shelter for unaccompanied migrant children at Freeman Coliseum. Judge Nelson Wolf saying in a news conference these children could be arriving as early as this week. As of right now, the agreement is that the Freeman Coliseum will hold these children for 60 days and can hold up to 2400. The goal, though, is to reunite these children with family already here in the U.S. If they can't find any family, Wolf says they'll be transferred to a licensed care facility. Officials say these children will be tested for COVID-19 at the border and every five days while here in Bear County. They will also be required to wear masks while in the facility. If any of them test positive, they will be moved to a different facility. 18 Republican senators visiting the Rio Grande Valley assessing and addressing the migrant situation along the Texas and Mexico border. Their visit included a tour of the Donna Detention Center, where they describe an overcrowded facility that's operating over capacity and in violation of COVID protocols. That group also joining the Texas Department of Public Safety on a boat tour overseeing areas along the river that are said to be used by smugglers. Our Jonathan Cotto is at the Anzaldúas Park in Mission where a press briefing was just held. And Jonathan, what have you learned? It's a collective sentiment amongst Republican senators who visited the Rio Grande Valley today. They say the Biden's administration lift on policies like the Remain in Mexico program has made it a little bit more difficult for law enforcement personnel working along the border. They say the Biden administration was warned and briefed of the consequences of lifting policies would cause. Senator Ted Cruz says the current administration isn't allowing media into the detention centers. He says the handlers to keep the matter silent and from hiding. We saw cages after cages after cages of little girls, of little boys lying side by side, touching each other, covered with reflective emergency blankets. There was no six foot space. There was no three foot space. There wasn't a three inch space. Cruz says the Biden administration is taking people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and caging them side by side. Senator Lindsey Graham says he's planning on reinstating the remain in Mexico policy. Meanwhile, President Biden yesterday in his first press conference says that the majority of families crossing are being sent back. Reporting live in the Rio Grande Valley, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Steve. Thank you, Jonathan. U.S. Representative Joaquin Castro led a Democratic congressional delegation tour of the Carrizo Springs facility for migrant children. Tiffany Huertas has more on their visit and spoke with the city manager of Carrizo Springs about the facility. There are folks that were from Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, many of the places in Central America. Democratic lawmakers sharing what they saw inside the child migrant facility in Carrizo Springs. They had a group of children for us to speak to, but we also interacted with others who were there spontaneously as well. It was extraordinary to see the number of medical staff here on site uh, to address not only obviously the physical, but also the trauma, but they are, you know, had us come and see how the quarantine process is and so forth. HHS says the facility can hold up to 952 children and houses immigrant children between the ages of 13 to 17. U.S. Representative Joaquin Castro says they also spoke with leadership of the facility. About practical recommendations for the Biden administration to speed up the process by which asylum claims are considered so that people don't have to wait either in these facilities, but most certainly in the CBP facilities that we've seen pictures of again recently. The city manager of Carrizo Springs, Ronnie Guest, says it's important that lawmakers get to see inside the facility. You know, it's a humanitarian crisis and we want to make sure that these children have the best care, that they're not being kept in a, in a, in a facility that's just not conducive to, to safety. A recommendation that was made today focused on how the federal government could keep people in places other than CBP processing centers. Reporting from Carrizo Springs, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The situation at the border has become the source of the latest political tug of war as both sides try to shift the blame. 
So what do the numbers show? Let's look at the data from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. In 2019, 2019 is actually this green graph that you see right here. The trends move up in the spring and then fall off again after May, topping off at 114,116 apprehensions. In 2020, that's this orange line here. The numbers are much lower than normal for a multitude of reasons. But we see that number again start to climb around the same time, May, April, and then goes up each month. Now this year is where we see the spike. That's this red line that we're seeing so far, jumping from 74,000 to more than 100,000 from January to February. We see that 2021 as of right now, following the trend that we saw in 2019, just with higher numbers right now, experts actually believe these immigration moves are more of a cycle than related to any policy, suggesting we'll see these numbers fall again this summer. We have a lot more statistics on our website, including demographics of those crossing over. How old are they? Where are they from? It's on our website right now at KSAT.com. Well, here at home, that picture there is of the iconic labor organizer Cesar Chavez on the left here in the middle left with his longtime family friend and ally Jaime Martinez there on the right. Both have since passed, yet Martinez became a well-known activist here. And one of those little boys grew up to carry on his father's annual Cesar Chavez March for Justice. Like the MLK March, it was considered the largest in the country until the pandemic forced both to make those events virtual. Jesse de Goyado now with a preview of tomorrow night's airing of the Cesar Chavez virtual celebration. The 70s blend of music, the visual montage are just for starters. That music combined with the footage, that first minute is, is my favorite. So you can almost feel like you're in the march. Just that now it's a Cesar Chavez virtual celebration commemorating what the late activist Jaime Martinez began 25 years ago. What would he think of the annual Cesar Chavez March that began on Guadalupe Street, now going virtual? And he would be, Mijo, get the laptop open, let's look at this together, and he would have done something together as a family. To engage viewers, since they're not there this year, and the others who never were, its producer relied on rare and some never seen images Jaime Martinez handed down to his son. I don't know what he has, but he had a gold mine of, of archives. David Chavez, no relation to Cesar, says he wanted to capture what it was like to live those moments in time. My favorite part was capturing the spirit of unity. That and the philosophy Cesar Chavez lived by, they say, are now more important than ever. Peacefully protest, nonviolence. You know, come together. Nothing wrong with controversy and debate. He would like that we're telling the story and that we're empowering our community. He lifted all of us up with him. Made us feel like si se puede, yes we can. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. The 25th anniversary Cesar Chavez virtual celebration will be on Facebook starting at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Also, there are four other places where you can watch. We have those listed on our website, ksat.com. Oh, if you're chopping off the gas tank this weekend, expect to pay around $2.51 a gallon. That's the average around town. It's also 80 cents higher than this time one year ago. That's because commuting and road trips pretty much came to a halt then, sending fuel prices into a free fall. In the past few months, though, demand has been climbing. Prices have as well. The chief analyst at GasBuddy.com tells us he does not expect a gallon to reach $3 this summer in Texas, but he does expect demand to take off. We've been stuck for a year, so a lot of Americans are looking to hit the road this summer. And of course, keep in mind for many Americans that want to, you know, take a vacation, uh, many countries overseas remain off limits. And so that could spur demand for gasoline higher here in the U.S. Americans staying closer to home because of those uh, global travel restrictions. And it's not just demand. Something else threatens to push the prices up. That stuck tanker blocking the Suez Canal, 10 percent of the world's oil travels through that trade route. The San Antonio Police Department looking for a missing teenager tonight believed to be in danger due to a medical condition. This is 40, 14 year old Rudy Udi. He was last seen just after midnight Tuesday in the 2100 block of Pecan Hollow. He is five foot six, brown eyes, black hair. He has a cross tattoo on his right wrist and an A tattoo on his left ring finger. 
Police say he was last seen in a black t-shirt, black sweatpants with a black baseball cap and leather jacket. Authorities also say he has a medical condition that requires immediate attention. If you have any information on Rudy's whereabouts, call SAPD's Missing Persons Unit at 210-207-7660. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam this evening. 85 degrees out there, kind of on the warm side right now, but boy, was it just a beautiful day out there today, Adam. Yeah, a little warmer than what we've been experiencing lately, but low humidity, so very pleasant overall. 48 degrees, the temperature this morning. Then we topped out at 85 for the high. The average high is 76 today. Looking at temperatures now still in the 80s. Castroville, 88 along with Pleasanton. 76 though, Canyon Lake, 82 and Comfort, 80 right now in Kerrville. Still 90 degrees as you get along the Rio Grande here. Del Rio 92 along with Laredo and even Catula at 91. Pretty straightforward this evening. No jacket necessary. Temperatures will be down in the 70s, then 60s tomorrow morning. Most of us starting the day in the 60s. By the afternoon, we make it well into the 80s. We're going to talk more about the weekend and our chance of rain coming right up. We're just moments away from the briefing on coronavirus from City Hall with the mayor and County Judge Nelson Wolf. A lot of talk I'm expected to uh, I'm expecting to hear about Freeman Coliseum and maybe some other sites that will be open for some of the unaccompanied migrants that we've been seeing. It's taking out a City Hall. Nelson Wolf and tonight we're joined by Christopher Sandals, who is the medical director and CEO of the South Texas Veterans Health Care System. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we're reporting 179 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 203,370. Our seven-day rolling average now is 185. Sadly, we do have one new death to report tonight. And please, again, as we have said before, please keep their families in your prayers uh, as each of these uh, numbers that we report each night is a loved one uh, who is dearly missed. There are 184 COVID-19 patients in local hospitals this evening. That's down four from yesterday. Over the last 24 hours, there were 37 new admissions for COVID-19. 75 patients are in the ICU and 40 are on ventilators. A vaccine update now. As of yesterday, Bear County has administered the va vaccine first dose to 445,651 people and 249,552 people are fully vaccinated in our communities. That's good news. I'm also pleased to report that nearly 60% of people aged 65 and up have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And a, a special note, effective Monday, anyone 80 years or older can show up at the Alamo Dome or one of our public health sites at any time without an appointment and get vaccinated. And in the meantime, let's all continue to do our part, wear our masks, social distance, and social distance and proper hygiene as we work in our community to get more people vaccinated. And remember that you can also sign up at, for text alerts to know when there's appointments available by texting vaccine or vacuna to 55000. Let me turn now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, vaccine, we're, we're racing as fast as we can to... Um Make sure everybody gets a vaccination um, out at University Hospital, Bear County Hospitals District. We've done a 243,000 now uh, since we started at that at, at the site at, at, at Wonderland, as well as the downtown or Robert B. Green Hospital. Uh, this week, we're running about 6,400 a day uh, for the first four days. We've done 22,967. And we started taking uh, signups for those that are 80 plus, giving them priority. Uh, we've had 300 sign up already, and we give, they have the priority. They can come and get their vac uh, vaccinations uh, uh, right now. So uh, we're moving along fine there, and we just need to try to get the vaccinations working as much as we can. And the good news is that the federal government's providing some vaccinations to a lot of other providers, uh, whether they're pharmacies or grocery stores, or and that's helping us uh, get shots in everybody's arms. So we're moving along, and I think we're 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 on a good pace to uh, try to get everybody uh, vaccinated. I might just say very briefly, as you know, we'll be uh, having uh, uh, these young people that will be uh, providing uh, a safe haven for them out at the Bear County grounds, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we 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 have some strict protocols of how we will handle uh, cases there. All the all the children before they leave the border and come here. Uh, we'll have a test to determine whether they're positive or, 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 or not. 
uh, while they're here on site every five days, uh, they will be tested again. And those that are positive, they'll have a separate uh, cohort for them where they have medical people there and be separated arrest from the uh, rest of the uh, population. All the adults that will be working there, we may have up to 300 um, you know, staff out there working. They will be tested, and uh, everybody within the facility uh, that will be there, the young people, they all have to wear a face mask. So extra precautions are taken to make sure we handle them. They're not going to be out in the community. Uh, they'll be in the center till we find a place uh, to take them, whether they're with the family, whether it's a mother, father, uh, grandmother, grandfather, uh, uncle, aunt, and try to get them placed with the family. Or if we can't place them with the family, then they'll go to one of the licensed care facilities, uh, such as St. Joseph's uh, here in, in town or, or some of the other places that we have here that can take them and, and, and decide uh, how they would be handled in the long run. So uh, we're being extra cautious on COVID. Right. Thank you, Judge. Um, before we wrap up tonight, I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Chris Sandals, who is going to give us an update on the care of our uh, veterans in our community with regard to COVID-19 and the vaccination process. Chris. Uh, thank you, Mayor. It's uh, great to be with you again. You know, it uh, really was... All right, an update there on how uh, veterans are being treated for COVID. Uh, but it was interesting. Uh, the thing that stuck out with me to hear from the mayor was that 60% of people 65 and up right now have received at least the first dose of COVID vaccine. That seems like very encouraging numbers for what we're seeing. Yeah, certainly making progress on that front. And he mentioned, of course, as a reminder of the community that on Monday, not only is everybody eligible, that, but that also those 80 and up can move to the front of the line Priority. without an appointment. Just go to any of those sites and you'll be able to get your vaccine. They also talked a little bit about the migrant children that are coming here to San Antonio. As we reported at the top of the show, they will be tested at the border, tested every five days, wearing face masks and things of that sort as they work to place them with either other families family here in the states or at other facilities here in town. Yeah, also encouraging that we continue to see low numbers of new cases and one new death reported today. It's sad news, but certainly a lower uh, numbers than we've seen, you know, just two months ago. Yeah. All right, let's switch over to weather right now and talk about the fact it's a beautiful day out there. A lot of people already starting their weekend and I am envious. <laughs> What, you don't want to be here with us right now, no, Steve? No, I'm just saying maybe Not the fun roof. enough. We need to sit on the roof is what I'm saying. Yeah, we need, we need to sit on the roof so we yes. can enjoy this weather and bring you news and weather. And a margarita machine. That'd be and, nice. Well, that, that's a bonus. <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of weather, right? Yeah. It is. It's beautiful outside today. We're lucky to have such a great Friday. Comfortable outside, sunny, low humidity. Here's our next system that's headed our way. Let's take a look at it. You see the activity over the Rocky Mountains? Well, some of that is going to head toward Texas. We've got that dip in the upper level flow. That's that ripple, the upper level disturbance. And that's a system that's going to affect us on Sunday. And I know we had some moderate hopes for some rainfall. It looked like there was a potential for us increasing the chances, but unfortunately, I don't think that's the case anymore. So let's go through the weekend. Saturday morning, damp just because of fog and drizzle. Low clouds to start the day and humid. Into the afternoon, we'll start to see some sunshine, especially along the Rio Grande. You'll see the sun earliest. Then we get into Sunday early in the morning around and even before sunrise, we're expecting some isolated showers and thunderstorms. This is 4 a.m. and the future cast is indicating a few hit or miss showers and thunderstorms, not expecting anything strong or severe at this time. And that's just for the first part of Sunday. Then we clear out and have some sunshine and the headline for Sunday is going to be the wind. But let's talk temperatures tomorrow morning. We're starting at 62 in San Antonio, 57 in Fredericksburg, Carrizo Springs, 66. Most of us low to mid 60s in the morning with those low clouds, but then sunshine in the afternoon, warming us up just like today, well into the 80s, even some 90s closer to the Rio Grande. Von Army 87 tomorrow along with Elmendorf, Seguin about 85, Timberwood Park 84, Bernie 84 for the high temperature and a southeasterly wind at only 5 to 15. We get into Sunday a little bit cooler because the gusty north wind drops temperatures in the mid 70s. That Slight chance of rain in the morning will lead to afternoon sunshine and a gusty day. I mean, we're talking a steady north wind at 20, but I'm anticipating wind gusts up to 40 to 45 miles per hour. So very noticeable in terms of the wind on Sunday. Early next week, pretty simple and straightforward. Decent amount of sunshine and temperatures still near 80. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, how sweet it is. The NCAA tournament continuing this weekend here in San Antonio. It is really sweet for four 
local basketball oh, players yeah. and their families because four of them are still alive in the Sweet 16, including Keanu Williams and Melissa Smith. We'll hear from both of them coming up. And three student athletes at Veterans Memorial High School signed their NLI. We got it coming up. players last night, including Kawhi Leonard. The Clippers still beat the Spurs 98-85. The game saw 10 lead changes and 13 ties. The Spurs' biggest lead was 9, while the Clippers led by as many as 13. And one key for the Clippers, again, was winning the battle of three-point shooting, 13-8. The Spurs' 85 points is a season low, and they've lost four straight. DeMar says it's because they've lost their rhythm. So the Spurs will host the Bulls tomorrow night, looking for that rhythm. 7.30 at the AT&T Center. Lonnie Walker IV is out again with a sore right wrist. It was a special day at Veterans Memorial High School with three student athletes signing their letter of intent. Soccer players Cameron Caldwell and Jaden Ferris will attend Texas A&M University at San Antonio. And wrestler Andres Garza will take his skills to New Mexico Highlands University. Caldwell and Ferris both love the family atmosphere at Texas A&M San Antonio, and they are thrilled to help the Jaguars kick off the men's soccer program. So to be able to go to college at a good school, you know, to get my, get my degree, and uh, to be able to play soccer, you know, play the game that I love, it's, it's everything to me and my family. Like Cameron said, it's uh, big on family. And uh, at the program here, uh, it was built on family and being together. And uh, that's why I chose it. Garza says he received 35 total wrestling scholarships across the nation, and he picked New Mexico Highlands with his family in mind. Proximity to home, it's the uh, closest school to Texas that has wrestling. Um, Hall of Fame coaching staff, um, you know, um, I, got fa I have family out there, so I just thought it was the perfect fit for me. Andres also says he wants to come back to SA after his four years in New Mexico and study law at St. Mary's University. Number one, Stanford is getting ready to face Missouri State in the NCAA Women's Sweet 16 Saturday, 2 p.m. at the Alamo Dome, Alamo Dome and live on KSAT 12. Fans will be allowed up to 17% capacity, so that's exciting for everyone involved. Stanford guard Keanu Williams was asked, what's the team been doing to have fun since they can't go out and explore? Considering that we've lived out of a hotel for uh for 10 weeks previously, uh, we kind of know, um, you know, have a routine of, of what to do. Um, so yesterday we, we had the chance to, to get on the boats and uh, ride along the river walk. Um, we have a ping pong table in our meeting room. Um, we have an Xbox and some games, um, you know, games that we can like socially distance. So we, we, have, we have things figured out um, when we're not, you know, watching film or, or doing basketball stuff. Kiana says the team has a ping pong tournament going on and that she was knocked out in the first round. The Sweet 16 tips off tomorrow with four games, including number six Michigan against number two Baylor. The Bears are coming off convincing back to back wins 101 52 versus Jackson State in round one and 90 48 against Va Tech in the second round. That game was played at Bill Grehe Arena at St. Mary's University. Baylor starter Alyssa Smith says playing this season during a pandemic has made the game she loves even more special. Oh, for sure. Every time we get to lace up our shoes and play basketball, it's a great feeling. Uh, just to go to war with this team every night uh, is something I'm really blessed to do. Uh, just to be on the team Baylor, I mean, the name for, by itself just speaks a lot, so I'm very blessed to be on this team. Baylor and Michigan will play tomorrow at 2 in the afternoon. You can watch it live right here on KSAT 12. Both the Baylor men's and women's teams still alive. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thanks, Slayer. You got it. KSAT Q&A is coming up next. We'll be right back. We are certainly living in unprecedented times. There's encouraging things that are happening, but we also need to be wary of things that are seen and unseen. And certainly as parents, we worry about our kids and how they're dealing with this pandemic. And that's the thing we want to talk about in our KSAT Q&A today. Tally Dold's the chief executive officer from Jewish Family Services joins us now. Tally, thank you for the time. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of kids and mental health during this pandemic? Well, thank you so much for having us. But um, the most important thing right now is we're seeing a huge uptick in stress and anxiety, depression and isolation in children, but also in parents. And yeah. what I want to say right now, it's it's across the board. We are seeing right now not only a pandemic in terms of COVID, we are seeing that as well with mental health stressors. 
You know, historic, historically, Tally, um, there's been a stigma, somewhat of a stigma associated with mental health and, and mental health issues. Um, do you get a sense that that is changing nowadays and in the time that we're in? I really do. I actually think one of the most beautiful things that have come out of this period of time is the fact that we are talking about mental health and wellness the same way we have talked about physical health. Um, we have spent a lot of time understanding over the last year that everyone is um, in some way impacted with some sort of mental health challenge from this last year. And we have all dealt with trauma because of this last year. So there is absolutely, I believe, a beautiful opportunity to destigmatize mental health and start to get the right help because this is so normalized and you have brought um, people on all the time to talk about it. Yeah, just talking about it and realizing yeah. that, I mean, I, I've, I've said it before, but asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, that there are resources out there and, and one of the, what, what I really want to talk about is what are some of the warning signs parents should look for? I mean, I, in ourselves, obviously, you talked about being isolated. Is it kind of the same with kids? Absolutely, but there are other things and there are other warning signs that you can be observant of with a child from their possible loss of appetite or maybe they have gained some weight. Um, their ongoing possible mood swings. I know a lot of parents are like, well, my kids are always pretty moody during this period of time. No, you know, an ongoing period of a child's mood or behavior change is definitely an indication that something is going on. And then if there's hopelessness or you see your child isolating, not returning texts to friends, not um, returning video chat, um, even not playing video games. A lot of kids have isolated themselves in their own rooms. Um, another big indicator is sleeping habits. If you see that your child is up late or is just you know, not falling asleep the way they did, these are all patterns that could contribute. I'm not saying they definitely contribute, but they could contribute to a mental health challenge. So just being aware of this is half the battle. I want to talk a little bit about social media. We certainly know that mobile phone use and mobile use has gone up um, during the pandemic. But my question is, how does social media play a part in either helping or hurting our children's mental health? So I will I want to give social media and technology a, a positive look before I talk to you about the positive, the negative impacts of social media. First of all, it has saved us this year. It has brought us together. It has connected us with people that we would not be able to see throughout the year because of the pandemic. So in some ways, and in some ways, it is absolutely a lifesaver. But at the same time, what it has done is actually brought us into a new reality and a new reality of possible social isolation, um, of comparing ourselves and our lives and our appearance to other people. Um, the endless hours of scrolling is, is absolutely dangerous for our health and our brains aren't equipped to deal with that. Um, Cyberbullying is up during this period of time. And um, actually, I know that you've done a, a big portion on cyberbullying, but that's, that's one of the big challenges with social media these days. And of course, all of these contribute to the risk of anxiety and depression. Um, one more thing I just want to add about social media is this fear of missing out. And that is one of the things that um, causes anxiety. We're not feeling like we belong. We're not feeling like we're in those pictures or uh, during this period of time for those of us who may have gotten the vaccine and who are venturing out some more, um, we're, there's a lot of people who are, who are missing that. And that's causing anxiety and that's causing isolation and that's causing a breakdown in our mental health capacity. 
So true. I know I have felt some of those Absolutely. things. Absolutely. I think, I think, as, par- I mean, I think sure. as parents, we need to, to watch our own yeah. well-being and realize that there's this is not a normal time. We should not act like everything's normal, and it's okay to take breaks and to acknowledge the fact that we are going through something that uh, has never been go- we've never gone through before. That's absolutely correct. I mean, and one of the things that I want parents to do or to hear in terms of a message is give yourself a break. Yeah. There's nobody who had the manual of how to deal with the last year. There's nobody who has gone unaffected in some way from mental health challenges, like I said. So really taking care of yourself is going to be the most important thing. And I think it's kind of like that analogy with putting your mask on before your child's. That is the most important thing right now for you to show up and be there for your child. Yeah, we we are not we are not in normal times. That's for sure. (laughs) We are not. Sally, thank you so much. Always such a pleasure to see you. Thank you for joining us. Have a great Thank weekend, you. Tally. Thanks. You too. We'll be right back. It's some eye-catching billboards in Manhattan trying to convince New York business executives to relocate their headquarters to Ohio. One prominent billboard in Times Square reads, your buildings are taller, our taxes are smaller. Following the pandemic, many New Yorkers have thought about moving out of the city to find roomier housing and lower rent. Many of their employers are also thinking about fleeing the Big Apple, so Ohio wanted to take a bite of that business. Jobs Ohio, which is behind the cheeky ad campaign, says they're getting a good response. Jobs Ohio is the Buckeye State's Economic Development Corporation, not to pick on New York exclusively. The campaign also targeting L.A., San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, Chicago, and Austin. Hmm. Interesting. I found Austin Austin's the- surprising in a way. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they are houses, growing really houses fast. Houses are expensive. Yeah. Yes, you they know. are. That, that's yeah. why we say that. Yeah. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. That sky out there just looks perfect. Just beautiful. <laughs> I want is. I want to grab that margarita with you, Adam. <laughs> just head outside. Right. It's a beautiful day. Hey, you know, venture out this evening. No jacket necessary. It's going to be comfortable. We're 84 right now. So actually on the warm side. By 8 o'clock, sun's down 77, 10 o'clock, right near 70 degrees, and then slipping into the 60s thereafter. Tomorrow morning, we'll start our day in the 60s, but some distinct and noticeable changes this weekend. We're going to detail those and talk about what we have in store for rain chances, particularly Sunday coming right up. A company that makes technology for voting machines is suing Fox News for over a billion dollars. Dominion Voting Systems filed a $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against the channel. The company claims Fox News participated in a disinformation campaign against them during the 2020 election. According to Dominion, allies of former President Trump, including Fox News, then promoted conspiracy theories about Dominion to support Trump's claims. A Fox spokesperson said the network was proud, quote, proud of its 2020 election coverage and will, quote, vigorously defend against this baseless lawsuit in court, in court, end quote. All right, I am hoping this nice weather hangs around through the weekend, Adam Kasky. Well, you know, we were lucky last weekend. That's true. Right, it was fantastic, just like this last weekend. I'm sugarcoating this here and just yeah, trying to Yeah, it's not going to be like this is the weekend's what you're telling me. <laughs> not, not, not this perfect. No, no, no. It's not going to. And, you know, we've been talking about some hope for rain on Sunday, but right now we're losing some confidence in that, unfortunately. unfortunately. So let's talk about that upper level system. See it over the Rockies, more mountain snowfall, widespread precipitation. It's dropping into the southern Rockies now. It's this dip in the upper level flow that disturbance that's dropping into Texas. And it's been a tricky one to really pinpoint exactly how it's going to react and what it's going to do when it gets into Texas. But here's what we can expect. Basically tomorrow, dampness in the morning, just in the form of fog and drizzle. Also humid, you'll notice the humidity right away. So gray sky to start the day tomorrow and a little bit of dampness. By the midday, those clouds start to erode and into the afternoon, we'll have some sunshine. Not a bad Saturday afternoon. It'll be in the mid 80s, some sunshine, but noticeable humidity. That's the first thing that you're going to pick up on tomorrow morning. As we get into Sunday morning, 
cold front drops in along with some of that upper level energy and we can't rule out a few isolated showers and thunderstorms. So cross your fingers for your neighborhood. But right now we're thinking about 30 to 40 percent of South Texas actually getting it. So most people probably missing out on the rain opposed to actually getting the rain Sunday morning. Then we clear out into Sunday afternoon. The headline Sunday I think is going to be the wind. So here's our forecast, the future cast for the wind. This is before sunrise on Sunday at 4 a.m. starting to pick up in the hill country. Cold front moves through and behind it. We're looking at steady winds around 20 to 25 miles per hour and likely wind gusts up to 40 45 miles per hour. So humid on Saturday with a little bit of dampness in the morning. Then Sunday the wind is the headline, but let's talk temperatures and how they're going to change a little bit. Earlier this morning we started at 48, a little below average, actually by five degrees. Then we topped out at 85, which is almost 10 degrees above average in the afternoon. We're still 90 degrees farther south and west of San Antonio. Even Pleasanton's 87. Meanwhile, dipping into the 70s now in the hill country, Kerrville Rock Springs 79. Early tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to readings mostly in the low to mid 60s. That is, unless you're in the hill country, in the hill country, we'll have some readings in the upper 50s. Then by your Saturday afternoon, we squeeze in that sunshine. Canyon Lakes looking at 84, Hondo at 87, 91 Carrizo Springs, Del Rio making it into the low 90s again. And you look locally, most of us will be in the mid 80s. Even as warm as 87 in Elmendorf and Von Army, about 84 in Bernie and Timberwood Park. By Sunday, a little bit cooler. That gusty north wind is going to push in some cooler air. So we're looking at a morning in the 50s and afternoon high temperature in the mid 70s. Slight chance of that morning rain, decent amount of afternoon sun, but breezy or gusty with that wind out of the north at times about 40, 45 miles per hour. So that's the weekend for you. Muggy on Saturday, windy on Sunday. Cross your fingers for that rain chance on Sunday morning because I think most of us will miss out opposed to actually get it. We get into next week and actually it's pretty quiet weather. Uh, we're looking at a lot of sunshine Monday, a good way to start the week. Monday, comfortable, low humidity, 70s. Sorry, we didn't have we couldn't have that over the weekend, but at least Monday is going to be a nice day. Get your week going on a on the right foot. Then we get into the midweek and we start to notice that wind pick up again and temperatures fall off a little bit as well. All right. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning to you. It is Friday, March 26th. A man is dead this morning after his truck flew off a ramp. An officer was on the traffic stop when he saw a truck going off the Frio exit ramp behind fire station number 11. A man also dead after police say he broke into his estranged wife's home last night. They say the suspect, 57-year-old John Pena Montez, was trying to get into the front door and was armed with a knife. The officers tased Montez. Officers managed to get inside and tased Montez once more. They say the shock only had a partial effect that time, and that's when one officer shot Montez, killing him. Meanwhile, Democratic lawmakers visiting the Carrizo Springs facility for migrant children this morning. They had a chance to actually speak with a few of these kids about their lives and their journey. President Biden inherited a situation where the previous administration had sought to dismantle the infrastructure for processing asylum seekers and settling asylum seekers in the United States. Senator Cruz and Senator Cornyn bringing along 16 other Republicans from non-border states to assess and address the situation on the Texas and U.S. border. Senator John Cornyn calling out the Biden administration being complicit in human smuggling operations and says this needs to stop. First at five, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf announcing the Freeman Coliseum will be used to temporarily house migrant children through a partnership with Health and Human Services. The county judge saying today the children will begin arriving sometime next week. The facility can hold up to 2,400 people. Right now, the agreement is only for 60 days. <laughs> It will cost more to watch content on Disney Plus. Disney raising the price of its monthly subscription to its streaming service. 
Starting Friday, Disney Plus goes up an extra dollar to $7.99 a month. This is the first time the service has raised its price since it debuted back in 2019. If you bundled Disney Plus with ESPN Plus and Hulu, you will also have to pay more. Your monthly subscription cost for the bundle also goes up by $1. Meantime, it is National Spinach Day. Popeye the Sailor Man loved his spinach, <laughs> and so do millions of Americans. So Friday, we are celebrating the nutritious leafy green with its own national day. You know, Popeye was good to the finish because he ate his spinach. Kids may not love it, but there is a lot for adults to love. Spinach loaded with iron, folic acid, fiber, cancer-fighting antioxidants. To honor National Spinach Day, have a spinach salad, sautéed spinach, spinach dip, cream spinach, or just blend some of the leaves into your breakfast smoothie. We do that. The kids never know. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, Taco Cabana announced they will be unveiling a new margarita flavor. And for some people, it's a little unusual, but not for me. Um, pickle flavored margaritas are going to be mm. making their way to a TC near you. I used to drink pickle juice as a kid, just out of the jar. So I'm looking I forward like to this. I like pickles. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I don't know. <laughs> the flavor originally started as an April Fool's joke post. It was such a popular idea. Taco Cabana made it a reality. You can get your own pickle margarita for $2 a cup for a limited time only. I'm here for it. There are other limited time flavors, including strawberry mint, mango jalapeno, and love potion. For more information, head to ksat.com. Adam Kasky, would you try a pickle margarita? I'd try it, but I don't think I would like it. Yeah. <laughs> I would like it. Yeah. We'll yeah. see you on the night.